to Joan. Well, hello. I'm so glad to welcome you, the library patrons and plant-based nutrition movement members, and maybe some of you that are joining from a distance. Glad to have you all here. And uh, I've got lots to share with you this evening. Uh, Karen and I will both be talking. I'll be uh, covering a lot of tonight's discussion. Um, and I know it's kind of common for the speaker to give answers, right? But I'm pulling a switch on you. You're going to be giving us some answers. Karen and I would like to tweak the next two programs so that we uh, try to make sure it's uh, focused on what you're interested in and also um, maybe questions that you have. So we're going to ask you to fill out some polling questions in the next few minutes, just so we know a little bit more about you. Now, all of these are anonymous and you don't have to answer the way you think we'd like to see the answers. Answer honestly, and uh, here comes the poll question one. Well, I'm sorry, that was poll question one, how many people are watching you? And then the next poll would be this one. Again, to give us a better idea of our audience, can you just tell us your age? And you see the uh, categories or you will soon uh, we'll get that poll up for you to answer the, that question. And then I have another question for you. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to pull that up and it's not letting me hang on one second. Sorry, folks. This is something new. I haven't done uh, polling with the presentations that I do. So uh, there's always little things that can go wrong. There we go. All right, there we go. If you could just answer. Thank you for doing that. Okay, we got about 93%. Do you want me to go ahead? I think we can go ahead to the next poll question. And then the next question is, oops, we're back to poll one, so. No, that's uh, poll two. Wait, so hang on. There we Great. go. Oh, there we go. Do you currently follow a whole food plant-based no oil diet? And just answer honestly. Again, remember it's anonymous. If you wanna say I'm a confirmed carnivore, that's just fine. Answer the way uh, that would be a no. <laughs> it's like most people are uh, answering that wanted to answer. Okay, we'll be ending it in just a few seconds. Uh, let's go one, two, three. I think we're gonna end it now. Okay, and then we have one more question for now. And uh, um, that will be your third question. Then we'll get into the program. And that question is what brought you here today? And you can, this can be as many answers as you wanna put down. We still have people answering, so I don't know if you want to go ahead and... It's a little bit longer question, isn't it? Because uh, we gave you a lot of choices. Yeah, we've got 90% answers. Yeah. Well, so. All right, we're going to get going. Okay. Would you like me to share the results or... Sure. That was for the last poll. Can you see that, Joan? I can see that. Mm -hmm. uh, will these be available after the program so we can kind of look through them? Yeah, we can get the great. Thing later too. All right, then I'm going to move ahead. And, um, you know, I am a nurse, but before I was a nurse, I was a teacher, a secondary teacher. And I'm going to get this poll out of the way here. And I always like my audiences to know where we're going. Uh, Karen and I hope to provide some nutrition information and some maybe nutritional inspiration for you uh, in the next three weeks. Tonight, I'm going to be covering the why of uh, plant-based nutrition. 
some basic concepts and definitely some research to get us grounded. Um, so that will be our first program. Next week, Karen will be talking about the how, plant-based, uh, more like the transition. And then on the 21st, we're gonna work together. Uh, we'll finish together with more specific strategies and resources for you. So tonight is um, the why. And I think it's an important question. And I'm, I, uh, as I said, I like my audiences to know where we're going. So I made up a list of, well, what are we gonna cover tonight? And uh, here, the, here it is. Uh, we're gonna start with stories. Everybody loves stories, right? Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about tales of recovery and discovery. So you will, we'll start with some stories and then um, I'm gonna intersperse a few other stories throughout the program because even though I love research, it can get a little dry. And I think sometimes it's important to uh, kind of put a face to the research. Well, what does this mean in terms of human beings and how they're going about living their lives? So I'm gonna give you some whys, but there's a big caveat that I'll talk about as far as when we're talking about stories or anecdotes. But we'll start with some stories and then we better talk about some definitions so we're all on the same page. And then um, we're gonna talk about well, what's the problem? Is there a problem? And uh, I don't think we'd be here if there weren't a problem, but uh, we'll talk about the problem. And then we better go into, well, what's the solution? And the solution can be found basically in the food. It can be found in the research about the food and the eaters. It can be uh, found in pioneering physicians who've looked at the connection between food and chronic conditions. And you know, the answers can be found in plants themselves. So we'll look a little bit, we're gonna analyze some spinach tonight. Uh, so that's uh, the next uh, part of the program. And then we're gonna talk about some considerations. If you'd wanna go on a plant-based journey, if you'd wanna start transitioning, what, would, what are some things to consider? And then of course, I'm gonna give you some resources and sources of support. Tonight and in each, each evening, we'll give you some, well, what's some help? You know, I don't wanna do this alone. Uh, so we'll give you that. And then finally, of course, we're gonna have questions and answers. So let's get started. I should probably acknowledge that there's a lot of um, wonderful reasons for plant-based nutrition. Um, and some people focus on the environment and certainly uh, a plant-based environment is, excuse me, plant-based eating is easier on the um, uh, planet. Um, it, it doesn't use as many resources to grow uh, plants, uh, vegetables and fruits versus animals. Um, but um, with that in mind, uh, you, you know, that is certainly one consideration. Certainly, uh, some people go plant-based because of the animals to avoid factory farming or just the fact that we're um, eating critters that we grow, uh, that we raise. All of those are important, but tonight we're gonna talk about human health and uh, the research and the stories. Now, I said there was one caveat when we talk about stories um, and that is, I don't want anyone to uh, say, well, I, I'm changing my diet because I heard an anecdote or I heard a story. I never want anyone to do that. I want you to change your diet if it's appropriate uh, because of science, because of solid evidence from research. So I will be presenting that tonight but I will give you those stories. So many people ask, Karen and I do presentations and the audience members always ask, well, why are you so passionate about plant-based nutrition? And I think that's a fair question. So I will be uh, talking a little bit about, well, why am I passionate about it? And Karen will have the opportunity as well. So, um, so that's where we're going tonight. And, uh, uh, I'm going to start with heart, two stories from the heart. And I have to say, often it's, um, it's, the, uh, it's a health symptom that causes people to change diets. And again, I promised you a story. So for many folks, it's a health concern. And that's the way it happened with Al. 
Karen's husband. And I'm going to ask her now to share his story. Okay, so our story, my story, um, whole food plant-based began about four years ago. So although I thought that Al, my husband and I were eating a very healthy diet, unfortunately, it took a more serious health threat to wake us up to the reality of what we were really consuming. After a few episodes of heart arrhythmia, which is irregular heart rate that landed my husband in the emergency room and then overnight in the hospital, we knew that we had to make some changes in our lifestyle. So as Al was lying in the hospital, he reflected on the facts that he also had high cholesterol, some shortness of breath, and he worried if these conditions would lead to stroke, paralysis, or disability. So as he was released from the hospital, the doctor said that he probably had a genetic propensity and there was little to do but take drugs. There was no direct mention of specific dietary changes. So once home, Al, who loves to research, did some research about the relationship between heart conditions and nutrition. And sure enough, he found the research and the work of the Esselstyns, both Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn from the Cleveland Clinic and his son, Rip Esselstyn from the Engine 2 program. He presented this to me. We dived in within a week. We watched some YouTube lectures, the documentaries. I got cookbooks from the library, but okay. We may have eaten some of the leftovers from the party that we hosted over the weekend, but we decided we were gonna have a trial run for um, six weeks and we didn't tell too many people at first because we weren't really sure where this was gonna go for us. But what happened is within six weeks, we had profound results. Um, Al's cholesterol dropped 50 points, now in the normal um, acceptable range. His shortness of breath was gone. He lost some weight. His joint sniffness, stiffness was better. Um, and he has had no more arrhythmias since that time. Uh, so we haven't turned back. We've kept at it just as we, as we started. So here's just a few quick epiphanies from, from Al um, to share with you. The first one is external appearance doesn't equate with what's under the hood. So for example, Jim Fix, who was a running expert, I'm, I'm dating myself here, but back to the 1970s, he died of a heart attack. The second one would be saying, I would rather eat what I want and just die. Well, that doesn't account for what happens most of the time as we age. Al was in the aging field for 25 years and he saw what can happen with debilitating chronic diseases. So there is one more epiphany that I'm going to share with you when I tell my story, which will be a little bit later in the presentation. Thank you, Karen, I love epiphanies. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move ahead and I'm going to tell you my story. Actually, it's um, more my husband's story. And it's kind of a personal story. Uh, it's a story of uh, recovery and discovery. In November, 2013, my seemingly healthy husband, uh, who was very active, non-smoking, average weight, uh, he, had, he was finishing a very busy year. He'd just gotten back from Antarctica doing a polar plunge there. And then he had a week sailing adventure followed by a scuba diving trip, which involved hoisting those heavy air tanks up and down a boat's ladder. Uh, once home, we went cross country skiing and he couldn't keep up with me, which was really unusual because I'm usually uh, much behind him. And then he told me he had a little bit of chest pain, but we weren't concerned because he has GERD, gastric esophageal reflux disease. Um, so we weren't too concerned, but the nurse and me advised him to uh, check with his cardiologist because he did have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, but you know we kind of thought who doesn't and it was well controlled. So um, we actually, I was just about retiring and we were gonna take a road trip uh, cross country. And I said, we better just check with the doctor. Well, that's what started it. Went to see his cardiologist who uh, wanted to do an EKG right away. And uh, the doctor started yelling at the nurses saying, do it again, do it again. And what he was referring to is do that EKG again because he didn't like the results. I thought he was being rude to those nurses, but he turned to my husband and he, sa he said, you're either having or just had a heart attack. Well, my husband, Mr. Cool said, uh, I don't think so. 
but okay, I'll, he, the doctor said, go to the, you need to go to the emergency room right now. Don't go home, just go right there. Well, foolish us, we shouldn't have done that, but that's what we did. We drove there and then he walked into the emergency room. And of course they said, oh, you're having a heart attack. You need to sit down. Um, bottom line, they did an angiogram right away. And bottom line, they found he had severe blockage and within 24 hours, he had a triple bypass. Um, it was quite shocking to us, but my husband was recovering smoothly. On uh, the fourth day, which is usually a day you are let out of the hospital to start your cardiac rehab, uh, he added a little drama to the story. His heart stopped. And I, being a nurse, did a little research and it's not unheard of, it's very rare, but about 3% of people with open heart surgery, their heart does stop on the fourth day. I think the heart's saying, I've had enough. Bottom line, fortunately he was in the right place. We hadn't started on our big trip and uh, he ended up uh, needing uh, an ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Um, well, physically he was doing okay. The doctor said, oh, we've patched you up. We'll just give you some more statins, more cholesterol medication, more blood pressure medication, and just keep doing what you've been doing. My husband's an engineer. He didn't buy it. He said, well, what I've been doing led me to a heart attack. There's gotta be something else. And he was pretty discouraged. We both were. And here comes my twin sister visiting like a twin sister should. And uh, she was in the hospital and she was reading the book, the same book that Karen mentioned, Prevent and Reverse Heart um, Disease. And I being a skeptical nurse said, you can't prevent heart disease. Give me that book. I was, and then I saw, oh, it's from the Cleveland Clinic. Well, then I did about rip it out of her hands because there was such hope in that book about um, uh, angiograms that actually showed improvement based on a pretty aggressive nutrition plan. So it gave us hope. It gave us enough hope that within a couple of weeks, we went out to the Cleveland Clinic, went through a workshop, came home and changed our eating habits entirely, got rid of the food that was in our pantry. And uh, cause we, we were pretty much vegetarian, but we uh, ate a lot of convenience food. Remember, I'm not much of a cook. So we ate a lot of convenience foods. They were all labeled healthy, they weren't. And uh, we changed and I um, had to do a little more cooking, a little more chopping, but quite frankly, um, we've never looked back. It's been, um, we've discovered a whole world of greens and grains and beans that we didn't know about. So uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that. But bottom line is the story had a very happy ending. My husband is thriving. He's back to scuba diving and skiing. And um, uh, that's, you know, that's kind of why I'm passionate about whole food plant-based. But again, don't change your health behaviors based on my story or anyone's story. Let's look at the research. And uh, I didn't know about the research and I'm assuming maybe you don't either. Uh, even though there's some studies that have been around for quite a while, it's an exploding field. So let's get into that. Um, now, uh, I am going, okay, I think we should probably talk about definitions now because I've been throwing around that term whole food plant-based. You know what a vegetarian is, right? They don't eat meat. Uh, there we go. Here comes my no meat. You know that. And then you probably know vegan, no animal products. So that would mean no meat. And by the way, when we say meat, we're talking chick chicken and fish. Uh, it's not just red meat. But no animal products would include eggs and uh, milk, cheese. Um, and then I, I, a lot of people use the term in, um, vegan as the same as whole food, plant-based, but there is a big difference. Um, vegan focuses on uh, more the animal and avoiding it, and uh, it's perfectly uh, fine, but if we say healthy vegan, generally then that eliminates the processed foods because there are two big culprits in our diet, the animal fat, uh, because it's so it's saturated fat, but also processed foods. So if you say, I practice a vegan diet, you know, then is it, um, do you also uh, try to minimize processed foods? 
That's what a whole food plant-based diet is. Most people use them interchangeably because that's a mouthful, whole food plant-based. And uh, vegan is easier to say, or you could say healthy vegan. Um, and some people, I just assume it's healthy, but uh, you know, you can eat Oreos and French fries and still be eating a vegan meal. So with that in mind, now that you have the definitions, you might be saying, oh my goodness, giving up cheese and milk, uh, eggs, what's left? Well, I, as I said, my husband and I discovered there's a whole world of greens and grains and beans and veggies and fruits and nuts and seeds out there that you may not know about. Um, uh, they're not necessarily um, in, in the standard American diet, but I assure you eating whole food plant-based, you will not go hungry and you will learn in part two, how to plan and prepare and enjoy all these delicious foods that are available. I, we actually expanded, we're eating a lot of different things, a lot more than we did when we were eating um, more of the standard American diet. So uh, now, what I'd like to look at now is well, what are most people eating these days? Um, and uh, I really like this graphics by, graphic by um, Dr. Dean Ornish, his food spectrum. And the way he did it, it has nothing to do with politics, red and green and right and left. It has to do with over on the left, we do have the unhealthy foods, high fat, high sugar, refined foods, calorie dense foods. And over on the right, we have nutrient dense plant-based foods. And you know what uh, 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 we might want to look at is, well, where should we be eating? And according to the dietary guidelines of um, the US, and we just had new dietary guidelines, they didn't change too much. Um, uh, basically, the government tells us at least half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. I'd like to see more than that, but uh, that's the recommendation. Half of the grains that you eat should be whole. I think they all should be whole. So, so in other words, I don't necessarily agree with this, but this would be a start. And then uh, our government tells us vary the protein, don't just have animal. And I would say vary the protein among plant-based sources. And then there's agreement to cut back on sugar, salt, fat, especially saturated fat. Now, where do you think most Americans are eating? Are they following these guidelines? I bet you're smart enough to know differently. Uh, let's just look at uh, where most Americans are eating way over in the red section. I bet you guessed that. Red meat, French fries, refined flours, those are all red foods. Uh, so with that in mind, and again, remember this is anonymous, where would you say you are on the food spectrum? Far left, red or orange, far right, or centrist? And again, it's anonymous. If you, if you know you eat a lot of junk food, well, Go ahead and give yourself a red. Give, give yourself credit for that right now. And thank you for filling out our polling. This helps us uh, tweak the, the future programs a bit too. I think I'll end it now. Is that good? I think it'd be good to end it now. Okay, and now I can go get rid of this. And one of the ways that we can look at this further is to like uh, take a look at, well, what percentage of calories uh, are we eating in certain categories? And uh, this is a good chart um, of uh, American eating habits. And it's kind of like a pie chart. We look at 63%, that huge chunk, is processed foods with added fats, oils, sugars, and refined grains. But you might say, well, 25% is protein. Animal food, yes, animal food does have protein, but it's also packaged with a lot of cholesterol that's found only in animal foods and also a lot of saturated fat, okay? But you say, well, Joan, there's still 12% that's plant food, but you know what? When they analyzed looking at what Americans were eating for uh, plant food, 
half of it, 6% was French fries. Started out as a healthy plant, potatoes, but um, a lot of fat added to it. So that leaves a measly 6% that's actually healthy whole plant foods. Now, you might say, well, is that a problem? How's that working out? How, how are our choice uh, towards calorie dense foods working out? Well, according to the executive summary 2015 dietary guidelines, not so good. <laughs> half, America, half of Americans have one or more chronic diseases related to our diet, such as diabetes, cardiovascular health, and obesity. So our choices aren't, um, uh, for most Americans, aren't working out very well. Okay, and about now you say, Joan, uh, you are depressing the heck out of me. Uh, uh, is it just a matter of time? Uh, you know, uh, is it just a matter of time before I either gain those pounds or I get one or more chronic diseases? M when will my doctor be telling me that, you know, now I'm one of those statistics? Well, I don't want to depress you. And the fact is, I've got some really good news to share with you. Growing old does not mean growing sick. And where is my little... <laughs> There we go, growing old and your genes are not your destiny. I like what Dr. Michael Greger said uh, in his How Not to Die book. Whatever genes we may have inherited from our parents, what we eat can affect how these genes affect our health. You know, you can turn genes on and off. Um, so the power is mainly in our hands and on our plates. Um, genes are, have been found to be much less responsible for those chronic diseases than uh, our lifestyle, especially our food. Now, uh, what I'd like to do now is bring, bring this more towards, uh, well, how does this play out? Uh, an example of someone who refused automatic chronic disease and weight gain. And uh, this is Stephanie. I know Stephanie, she lives in this area. She has a thriving business. And I wanna tell you a little bit about her story. You see Stephanie is, I can right here. This was the before and this is the after. And uh, um, she, uh, she um, is quite a remarkable woman. Uh, I'm gonna read from an interview. Stephanie was the typical American mom who thought as she and her husband got older, they'd simply get bigger and sicker. Stephanie had struggled with obesity most of her life. And she said, I tried everything. Also, she had fairly severe chronic condition. She had fairly severe chronic conditions as did her overweight husband. In fact, they were just recovering from their ninth surgery in 11 months when in 2015, her 15 year old daughter came home saying, mom, I wanna go vegan. And Stephanie said, no way, worst idea in the world. And I'm quoting uh, from uh, the interview. But being a good mom, she did some research for her daughter's sake. And she was surprised to learn that going plant-based might actually offer some hope for her and her family. So she decided to give vegan the approach a try and was shocked that not only did she and her family survive, but they thrived. Stephanie went from using a walker and um, being on many different kinds of medications to biking 100 miles a week with no pills. Collectively, her family lost 250 pounds and she regained, um, uh, or she says, they, we ate ourselves out of the grave. Stephanie has since become a food for life instructor for a physician center for responsible medicine. And she teaches cooking classes, sharing her amazing enthusiasm for whole food plant-based nutrition through her company, Plantspiration. Now I give you um, her as an example. And if you want to learn more about her, this website, um, uh, her website, which is below, um, I'll give that to you later if you're interested in that. So uh, because we're talking about specific conditions that can be caused by poor nutrition, I'm going to have a poll question about weight gain. Um, and I'm, we're gonna pull that one up now. And we do know that COVID has brought a lot of extra unwanted pounds for many Americans. And I am asking, is weight loss an issue for you or a family member? 
So that's a simple yes or no. I'm thinking we're we're yeah. getting pretty much finished with this poll. I think we can we can close this poll. Yeah, I ended it. Okay, and I thank you for uh, responding here. Let's go. It's time now, folks, to get into the hardcore research. And I'm going to tell you, I love research, but I've discovered that not everybody's quite as enthusiastic as I am about this. So I used to give 12 research studies. You can thank me that I've cut it down to just six tonight. Uh, and this is the first one. It's a very well-known uh, research area. It's many studies, but maybe you've not heard of the blue zones. It's an epidemiology study, meaning we're looking at population groups and especially about their eating habits. Um, now, about 20 years ago, researchers discovered that there are places where people live really long but healthy lives without the chronic uh, conditions that are found in the US and other developing countries. Um, they were studied in great, great detail because they seem to be like pockets of longevity. How were they getting by with living so long and living so well? Uh, the first blue zone that was discovered was in Sardinia, Italy. Uh, it's on an island right off the boot of Italy. And then they discovered people that were living the same, uh, had diff slightly different habits, but they um, were living long, healthy lives. And that was in Okinawa, Japan, another island. And then um, another blue zone was found in uh, the Nicoyan Peninsula in Costa Rica. And then there was another one found in Ikaria, Greece. And drum roll, please. We have one in the US and it's in Loma Linda, California. Now, why is it there? Well, that's where the biggest community of Seventh-day Adventists live and their religion encourages plant-based eating and many other healthy habits. So those are the five blue zones. And now let's take a look at the characteristics because that's what the researchers did. And this wasn't a fly-by-night research. What they did is they very carefully analyzed what were these people doing that is uh, different? What habits do they have that are different? Um, and what they found, then they put it all together using Venn diagrams. And it's very interesting research. And if you wanna go on the Blue Zone website, you'll learn lots more about um, this, uh, this amazing research. But what they found is these people had family connections in all five Blue Zones. They had social engagement. They didn't smoke and they had constant moderate activity. Uh, in the first one um, in Italy, they uh, were shepherds. Well, they get a lot of walking throughout their day, moderate activity, but all the blue zones, the people were walkers and they were active. Um, they weren't necessarily going to gyms, but they got activity throughout the day. Now, what I wanna focus on, what were they eating? <laughs> And as I said, they were semi-vegetarian. The majority of the food that they got were from plants or was from plants. And uh, they eat a lot of legumes or beans. It was very notable that, that it was very different than the way certainly Americans eat. So that's what we learned from the blue zones. Uh, and uh, this, the studies keep going on, but uh, that was, um, one study that was really showing the, the association between a healthy diet and a healthy life. Now, you're done with one already. One research study. Let's look at the second one. Now, this is another epidemiology study. And you see over here 100%. This is um, uh, based on killer diseases. You do not want to be 100% because then you would be dying of either heart disease or cancer. Okay, so you don't want a high number here. And then uh, here is um, uh, the um, percentage of calories from unrefined plant foods. So you can see 
you don't, if it were just based on um, life, uh, living long, and uh, you would not want to be a Hungarian, uh, at least when the study was done, because those people had very high rates of either heart disease or cancer. And by the way, they ate very little unrefined plant food. Okay, and then we can go over here. Well, let's say Sweden, how are they doing? Well, they're better. Um, but, you know, we can go down, you can see it's going down here. So when we get to um, the US, or we didn't have to go far, US, we're not doing very well, over 80%, um, uh, you know, that's uh, for killer diseases, percentage of death from heart disease and cancer. And how much, how much refined uh, plant food are we eating? Not very much. Now let's take a look at Laos. Laos, very few deaths from heart disease and cancer. And look at what they're eating. Now, again, this is epidemiology research. It's not gonna show cause and effect. It's gonna show association, but we can say basically the higher the consumption of refined plant foods, the lower the um, rate of killer diseases. And that's an important association we need to keep track of. It doesn't mean like everybody in a certain country is gonna die of one of these diseases uh, or that some people in these countries eat a lot of unrefined plant food, but generally as a population, we're talking about trends. Okay, so that's the second study. And now let's look at a third study. Now, this third study uh, you may have heard of in terms of forks over knives. Um, but uh, uh, it started out, I, I really want to tell you about this because you may not have heard of the book, The China Study. Uh, and that is a review of an epic epidemiology study done by Dr. T. Colin Campbell. You see him there. And it was been described uh, as the most comprehensive nutritional study ever conducted. And what's special about it is that it was huge. And um, uh, the amount of data um, uh, uh, with the opportunity to really compare plant-based versus animal-based diets was amazing. 6,500 adults in 65 counties across China uh, were looked at with 367 variables. And then they, it was compared to our diets. And what we found, we could kind of expect this, China ate less protein, and less total protein from animals. How much so? Well, 70% of our protein was from animals, 10% was in China was from animals. Now this was very consistent with other studies and lab results. Um, so uh, the concentration of animal protein in the average US diet is about 10 times greater than in rural China. What this study did is it, excuse me, identified patterns of disease associated with radically different US and Chinese diets. It was a great study design and um, it was rigorously reviewed and published in prestigious peer reviewed uh, medical journals. It was top notch, which was good because the surprising, the findings were rather surprising and they needed to be scrupulously verified. And I give Dr. Uh, Campbell a lot of credit for being so careful about the research. After all, you know, he, he came from a dairy farming background and he initially believed like most Americans that uh, animal protein is especially good for humans. But what he learned was too much animal protein can have harmful effects. And this was the first big study. There have been many since, but first big study to demonstrate this. So um, he, he's a smart man and he's so thorough. He being a good researcher, he went back to his labs and followed up with lab studies. And uh, he, he um, uh, ended up in, um, the study involved feeding lab rats varying diets of animal protein. And the protein they used was casein, which is found in milk and cheese. And the research um, showed it confirmed 
tumor growth was greatly enhanced by diets containing greater than 10% of animal protein and completely repressed with either 5% animal protein or greater than 20% plant protein. So um, he actually discovered that you could turn cancer on and off by varying the percentage of animal protein or by switching animal to plant protein. Now we know that animal protein increases the risk of certain cancers. We didn't know then, uh, but this was uh, <laughs> the landmark study and that's why I like to share it with you. Now, in the book, the China study that I showed you, this is described in great detail and it is great research, but I'll admit it's, it's not exactly a page turner. So it's a little dry. So if you wanna watch the popular video, Forks Over Nice, which features that research, but in maybe a little easier to digest format, I would, you know, I would say that that might be a way you want to approach it. Okay, but that's our uh, study that I wanted to take the time to um, look at. Now let's look at another uh, study looking at cancer and um, uh, animal protein. Now in this time, what they did, uh, what the researchers did is Breast cancer is here and animal protein fat intake is here. And then they plotted all these countries and uh, uh, took a look at um, where, which countries were having more cases of breast cancer per uh, um, a, a, a population. And, uh, um, I, it, it was most interesting. Um, I'm gonna finish up this and then I'm gonna ask Karen uh, um, how she responded to this issue, but let's, let's finish this uh, study real quickly. Um, uh, oh, let's see. You can see the breast cancer. Well, bottom line, I think I have some. The higher the consumption of animal protein and fat intake, which is again, what's along the bottom, the higher the rate of breast cancer. Again, it's an epidemiology study. It shows association, but it's not an association that we particularly want to see. And when we see the U.S. is fairly high in breast cancer, and we know that we are fairly high in animal protein, um, you know, we'd be better. We'd want to be over here by Thailand. Um, not uh, and Thailand has very little animal protein and very little breast cancer. So with that said, I'm going to ask Karen to share. She has a, uh, uh, information. She's faced that cancer connection, um, and she can tell you a little bit about um, uh, how she's responded to that. OK, I'm back again with another story. <laughs> so I've already learned about how that whole food plant-based diet could also reduce my risk of heart disease, which I wanna to mention too. In fact, it has lowered my cholesterol, I've lost weight, and they did improve other things like digestion and so on. But through my diving into the world of whole food plant-based, I discovered, as Joan was just mentioning, the relationship between cancer risk, and it's especially with breast, colon, and prostate cancers, um, that relationship between risk and nutrition. So most breast cancer does not have a genetic link. Really only five to 10% are genetically related. So for all of you out there, um, as Christy Funk who wrote a book about breast cancer said, anybody with breasts should know this, um, that should make you think extra hard about the causes in the other 90 to 95% of the cases. However, our family does have a genetic link on my maternal side, all the way back to my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, and my sister. Um, the PALB2 gene is a lesser known subset of the BRCA, which most of you are probably familiar with, which um, my sister and I both tested positive for. So that puts me in a very high risk. Now, my cancer surviving, fortunately, sister, is a dietitian, and now guess what? She also follows a plant-based lifestyle. So we've figured it out. So here's that third epiphany that I was, if you were all waiting for. Mm -hmm. um, there is no guarantee of what tomorrow may bring. It's kind of like driving a car, right? You can do everything you want to try to stay safe. So we all wear our seatbelt, we drive the speed limit, you know, mostly. 
we don't drink and drive, but we still could get hit by the proverbial bus, no matter, you know, but you did what you knew to do was the best. So I needed to do something to optimize my chances to feel empowered, to reduce my risk and to affect my destiny. Like Joan said, we all need our why. This is my why. Um, so I have, a, I have one quote that I wanna leave you with before I'm back at the end for question and answers and part two of our class. But this is a quote from Maya Angelou. It goes like this, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. So that's what, that's what we're doing. So I, I hope you will pick up some little tidbit that will help you do better tonight. So I'm gonna sign off until a little bit later. Thank you, Karen. That was a nice uh, point of inspiration and in how to take a little more control of one's life. So um, we're gonna move on. We've kind of talked about the cancer nutrition connection. Um, I'm seeing the time. I guess I'm not gonna spend so much time. It's, this is a lovely story about an educator who um, was diagnosed with late stage ovarian cancer. I've met Sally, she's an amazing uh, person, very involved with the plant-based um, nutrition movement and um, uh, our uh, plant-based um, uh, program in uh, I think Pennsylvania. Uh, I met her when, actually when we were on a cruise together, uh, but she ended up having a, a gene of, um, uh, but uh, she uh, decided she was going to learn all she could, and then she went plant-based, and uh, it's quite a story, and she's written a book, Beyond Cancer, that's a, a good one. I'll be giving you this information later if you, you know, if you wanted to look her up. Okay, and again, it's not just breast cancer. We know that cow's milk has been associated with hormone-dependent cancers, including breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. Uh, and then we also know, I don't want to just talk about when we say pr uh, prostate cancer, there's positive things you can do, as well as certain foods you might want to avoid. We learn that prostate cancer risk is, uh, the progression is slowed if you um, depend on fruits and vegetables, especially tomatoes, and also cruciferous vegetables. So uh, prostate cancer is very sensitive to what you're eating. And, uh, you know, so that's uh, something that you'd want to know. So that's my fifth research study. And the sixth one is on migrants. And, you know, uh, people look at this because migrants, when they usually come to our country, they start out, now they're young, so maybe that's part of it, uh, but they start out healthier, but the longer they stay, the worse they fare. Um, it, uh, it's been shown that the adoption of the Western dietary habits increases obesity and type two um, diabetes. So, and there's lots of research studies on migrants and, um, and if, they, if they keep with their old ways of eating, they are less prone and less at risk for some of these conditions like the obesity and type two. And uh, because I mentioned um, obesity, excuse me, uh, diabetes, Here's two gentlemen who, three gentlemen, no, I'm sorry, he looks so different when he lost weight, um, but this is um, Howard Bilek, and I'm not going to tell his whole story, but uh, he, he looked like this, he was having all kinds of health problems, now he's out riding his bike and um, uh, he dropped a lot of weight, but he also changed his diabe uh, diabetes and he doesn't take medication anymore. And then this gentleman has been in the news quite a bit, um, uh, Eric Adams, because he reversed his diabetes diagnosis. And if maybe you say, oh, Joan, I don't, I don't have time to be reading an article or a book. This is a video, three minute video that's, um, uh, you know, he tells a good story. So again, that's available for you. But um, I want to move ahead because we do have a few more things to cover. Um, the seventh oh, I cheated. I told you six studies, but I have seven here. Meat consumption. Uh, meat consumption we know quite a bit about meat consumption. It's positively associated with increased overall mortality, increased heart disease, and increased cancer mortality. And there are my sources, um, but uh, one of the things that you're probably familiar with, the International Agency on Research on Cancer um, classified meat as a class two carcinogen, the red meat, 
and processed meat as class one. So we've got strong studies showing the connection between um, animal protein and uh, con severe conditions. Okay, and my, my last study. I've been giving you a lot of epi studies. Sometimes it's nice to have a different kind of study. This study actually looked at our gut microbiome and that's been in the news so much. And what did they find? Well, it turns out if you are um, eating a whole food plant-based diet, the little microbes in your uh, gut are very different from someone who's eating a standard American diet. And it turns out there's a lot more variety in the vegan or vegetarian gut. And that's a real good thing because we are learning those microbes are so important to our health. They do all sorts of things besides nutrition, besides digestion. So we want a good variety of um, uh, gut microbiome and you're gonna get it if you eat um, whole food plant-based because you're getting a lot of variety in the food you're eating, plus the fiber that those little microbes love. So again, there's all kinds of studies. There's lab studies, there's epi studies, there's um, you know a variety of studies, but I wanted to show you that. Now I could have just told you this at the beginning that healthful, nutritionally adequate um, um, diets provide health benefits, but I wanted to give you the, some of the research to show that you know I, um, it, it's just not an agency that made this up. It's all based on research. Uh, this. Uh, is something that the Annual Review of Public Health, the public health uh, agency, uh, very respected, said, and I like this, the weight of evidence strongly supports a diet of minimally processed foods close to nature, predominantly plants, which is decisively associated with health promotion and disease prevention. Another way of saying that's a little less formal, Michael, Michael Pollan puts it this way, don't eat processed crap. Um, same idea. If you want to be healthy, you know you have to. You want to go this way. If you want a more research and nuanced um, answer, take a look at what um, Juliana Hevier she um, has written, Physician Guide um, to Plant-Based Diets, and she, you know these are all the studies studies that uh, plant-based diets are associated with ischemic lowering ischemic heart disease mortality weight management, uh, med reducing medication. I could go on and on. Um, the studies are there, folks. Um, so I'm just giving you a summary here. Now, we could also look for research focusing on plants themselves. And what do plants have in them? Well, we know they got vitamins and minerals. You know that. They have some protein, yes. And uh, they also have fiber. And they have antioxidants, 64% more than uh, animal, uh, and then phytochemicals, like you've heard of beta carotene and lycopene, curcumin, resveratrol. All these are really healthy. We're just learning about some of these, uh, but there are thousands of beneficial compounds in plants that we're just learning about. And what don't we get? We don't get cholesterol. There's no cholesterol in uh, plants. We don't get much saturated fat. Only a few plants like coconut and uh, um, avocado have uh, some uh, fats in them and generally they're not saturated fats. And then harmful additives. You don't have harmful additives added to a sweet potato. Um, you know, you don't have the chemicals. Okay, and let's look at a plant itself, spinach. Let's, uh, our victim is spinach. And what does it provide to you? Look at all the things it provides for you. Um, so we can look for plants themselves and look at the nutrients in a, in a plant. We can look for some answers in the pioneering doctors, but again, I'm kind of rushed for time. There's a whole crew, starting with Nathan Pritikin. Uh, he was a longevity researcher. We've got Dr. McDougall. We've got Joel Furman. We've got Dr. Neil Bernard. We've got um, Dr. Dar Garth Davis, who wrote a book called Proteinaholic. Um, we've got Dean Ornish. And his program's actually covered under Medicare now. Um, we've got, uh, again, one of my favorites, Dr. Caldwell Esselton and his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Um, he, by the way, treated former President Clinton 
Um, you may have heard of him from that. And then again, I do like Dr. Michael Greger. I think he's the most science-based. He, oh, his motto is show me the science. And he's got one bestseller out, How Not to Die. And then he's just written How Not to Die It. He added a T to it. And uh, both great books, very resourceful. And if you want a good website, nutritionfacts.org, I would direct you there um, for fact-based research. Okay. Now, one of the things you might say, well, if all these doctors are talking about it, how come, how come we're, we get such mixed messages? Why is it so confusing? Well, it's confusing because millions of marketing dollars go into luring you to eat foods that can make you sick. You know, there's no, I mean, there's good reasons why it's hard to eat a healthy diet. Not to say you can't, and not to say we can't share some tips with you the next time we meet. Uh, but uh, there's reasons why. So with that in mind, I have a couple more poll questions. And this one has to do with the, that we're bombarded with so much nutritional information. How confident do you feel evaluating nutritional cl claims? So I'll let you look through the question and answer it if you would, please. Okay, shall we, uh, I think we can close this one out and move on to the next slide. I will, I will shut this off and we'll move on. Okay, again, it's challenging to, mark, uh, to uh, make smart nutritional choices. And uh, that's why it's so important that you get some advice and help and support. And one of the organizations that can help you is plant-based nutrition movement. It's local. And uh, some of you have come from that organization, but uh, a wealth of information on the website, there is the website. And I encourage you to get involved because you'll find other people who can uh, be supportive and uh, help you if you decide you wanna make some changes. Okay, there's lots of books, there's movies, there's internet articles. And the good news is Karen uh, worked very hard to get a good resource list. Um, and uh, that will be made available to you um, so that you can have uh, some additional resources. This is a book I especially like, The Forks Over Knives Plan, because it's a, uh, it kind of takes you by the hand. How to transition. There are other ones, there are, um, uh, kickstart programs. There's a lot of good resources out there. You're probably getting tired of answering questions, but I'm going to ask you to bear with me. And we have two more questions for you. And this will be helpful for us in planning future pro programs. If you could just answer the question, question, what's the most helpful attending this class? And some of you, you might like the stories. Some of you, I don't want stories. I want research, you know, so this will be helpful for us to know. Okay, to move it along so we have time for questions, I'm going to exit from this one and then we're gonna go right into the another, another one. And that's the last poll question. There it is. And again, answer honestly, don't feel like, oh, I don't wanna disappoint Joan. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm better not say that I'm not planning to make any dietary changes. Is that, if that's where you're at, Answer, answer it the way you want. And remember, it's anonymous.
Okay, I think we can probably end it. I will move here. Woo! We have gone from blue zones to microbiomes, meat to migrant research, nutrition and the heart disease, cancer, diabetes connection, and we got through all the studies. Again, um, I appreciate your um, uh, attention to these researches. I want to let you know next week, so it's coming, part two, 12 practical tips to start your journey. And these are the kind of questions that Karen is going to be answering. And uh, at this point, um, I don't know, Karen, if you have any comments you want to make about next week, or this is kind of, this is a teaser, hopefully that uh, you will uh, join us next week. And um, then I think we can open it up for questions. I appreciate your attention and appreciate your answering the polls. This is the first time I've worked with polls. So uh, maybe we were a little overboard. We gave you a lot of questions to answer, but it will be helpful. And I appreciate your doing that. So uh, I think I will stop sharing at this point. And we can, there we go. And we can move ahead here.